ってもちろん Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of UiPath Forward 2024. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host and, co and analyst, Dave Vellante. We've got two guests for this segment. I'd like to welcome to the show Vivek Valesha. He is the Associate VP, Intelligent Automation at Persistent Systems. Thank welcome, you. Vivek. And Derek Downs, Head of Channels and Alliances at Out Systems. Thank you so much for coming Thanks on for the program. Us. So I want to start, before we get into this uh, low code revolution here and Gen, Gen AI. I want you both to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your companies and what, what you're all about. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Vivek, part of the intelligent automation team at Persistent Systems. Persistent Systems has been around for 30 years, one of the fastest growing IT companies. And uh, we are a core product engineering company that has trying to revolutionize the software development space. And here we are partnering with OutSystems and UiPath for that. So so I'm Derek Downs uh, with Out Systems. So Out Systems is actually around for 22 years, and the whole low-code space uh, was actually coined originally uh, by our CEO. Uh, Paolo Rosado and some discussions with some of the analysts and said, hey, what are we going to call this space? But as we fast forward now, we see um, a lot of our customers are starting to figure out how do they do the heavy lifting, um, and, and low-code out systems is there to do that. So what's the, I'm glad you brought that up with Paolo and, and the history of sort of low-code. Many, many, long time ago, I coded an assembler. That was not low-code. <laughs> it was load A, store A, and you were loading registers. So, but, but then, as higher level languages sort of ascended, were those like quasi low code? And how did low code, what's the, what was the, the demarcation point between sort of legacy approaches and true low code? Yeah, well it, it really originated from, as software development's taking place, how do we get better at that and how do we start to optimize? And so a lot of it originally was more on the process side. How do we start to make sure that we have the right process, the right structure? Then it was, how do we optimize and reuse some of the same components? And a lot of that work then started to go into kind of a common body um, to say, oh, okay, let's leverage this because it can help us do it a whole lot faster. So Persistent Systems and OutSystems have been partners for a little over seven years. Eight years, yep. Eight years, okay, so what makes this partnership so unique and, and what is the synergy at work here? So uh, what's unique about Persistent and OutSystems is in terms of Persistent is looking not just at automation from a UiPath perspective or low code from an OutSystems perspective, we want to take a step back, see what the actual issue that is, uh, what the customer is facing, what technology can address it, and bring these technologies that are now residing in silos all together, stitch them all back, so we are able to provide an end-to-end hyper-automation solution for our customers. It's more beneficial, brings you more ROI, and it's much better in terms of long run because we are able to design better solutions for them. So, can you explain the relationship between, so George Gilbert, one of our analysts, is Dave, all these agentic systems, it, it, they, first of all, they have to be a system. Mm -hmm. You got to have system thinking, which is Vivek, what you're sort of alluded to. But the other piece he said is, you need low code. Yeah. Can you explain both of those concepts? Why you need systems thinking to succeed? Maybe th that's... Human systems thinking. Um, yeah. Well, you know, a system. <laughs> yeah, whether it's human or machine, but it's got to be a system. It's got to be a closed loop system that learns and is organic. Uh, right. And then low code, what, yep. what role each of those plays? Maybe Vivek yeah. could start. So if you, if you look how intelligent automation or low code or RPA has evolved, we started with very basic RPA, we moved on to more of automation, then we started calling it intelligent automation, now we have Gen AI. But through all the spaces, what has really changed is how you're changing the, the, the underlying processes have remained the same, we have made them more efficient. The systems have become better in terms of automating it and making it more efficient. But if somebody like Persistent comes in, you're able to look at the long-term vision for a customer, and tomorrow, instead of Gen AI, there's going to be a new technology. So if you're not doing the basics correctly, you're not going to be able to upgrade to the next version of whatever the next Gen AI is going to be. So Persistent takes a step back and helps you look at that long-term vision, and then look at 
whether it's low code, whether it's RPA, or a combination of the best of the breed technologies to sort of help you design that solution. And, and, and I think the concept is, I mean, the North Star that we sort of think about is a, a digital representation of your business. Some people call it a digital twin, but in yeah. real time, you know, not strings that databases understand, but people, places, and things. And yeah. this is perhaps where low code comes in, because you're unleashing the power of of the domain experts and the people that are on the front lines. It's definitely the case. And I think we also see, you know, a lot of customers, a lot, a lot of companies right now are saying, hey, Gen AI, it's much like cloud for those of us a little older. Uh, cloud was, it was kind of overarching and it was everything, but nobody knew exactly what they were going to do. We kind of saw some of the same impact for a lot of uh, the companies that are saying, Gen AI, yes, we know we need to do it, but they went ahead and paused making decisions or investments because they just didn't quite know. and the fear and uncertainty was a big part of it. How do we make sure that we have some governance? How do we make sure we have security? How do we make sure we have control? And that's what's really led to say, Gen AI plus low code really starts to deliver that. Because low code was already built and established to make sure that you have the governance, structure, and security in place. So generative AI lets you do it quickly. How do we really leverage all of this power of automation? And you heard it from the main stage today. Um, being able to move from just the bots to the agents, how do you have that intelligent driving? And then low code really becomes a controlled structure to have that governance in place. So, oh, go ahead, please. I was just going to ask, so how, how is it actually combining two modernized industries like manufacturing and retail and banking and healthcare? What, what is actually happening here? So you want to... Absolutely, so when you look at uh, any of these industries, what we do is uh, we look at the heat map of the industry. What are the best processes that everybody is following? What is the industry norm over here? And then we start looking at which are the processes that are more prone to automation, which is where you're going to get your maximum ROI. And that's where we look at something like UiPath or OutSystems yep. or marry these technologies to bring you the maximum ROI for those specific processes and then provide that outcome to the end customer. Now, it does not matter whether it's BFSI, where we're talking about loan origination systems, or you're talking about healthcare, where you're talking about patient experience. What really matters is how you're making this experience for the end consumer, whoever that might be, whether it's internal or external, more seamless and more agnostic to what the technology is. So let's talk about this experience and let's take healthcare as an example. Of, of a really, uh, an industry that uh, most of us can least relate to. Yep. And to come, I want to come back to this idea of a system. So I think about healthcare and I think about my own experience, it's just this set of bespoke information that I can't get my arms around. Or the, the doctor might say, well, you should go see a dermatologist or maybe you should get a stress test. Or what about that calcium test? I'm like, what am I, what is this <laughs> thing on my calendar for? I don't even know. So you've got, I'm just thinking about it here. You got scheduling, you got facilities, equipment, you got payers, providers, you got historical records. Yep. You, you've got you know, the patient in the, in the middle of all this who's so confused. So I, this idea of a system yep. um, comes into play. Are you envisioning that we will actually have a system in that industry and then we can talk about financial services and, and other industries? We're not just envisioning, we're actually implementing it. So we are doing that for one of the largest healthcare providers in the, in, in the US. We call the solution as our digital front office or digital front door. It's mainly modernizing the entire patient experience. So as you're saying, it is confusing, it is all uh, spirotic, it is not consolidated altogether. So when we look at it, we are trying to build a unified system of layer at the top of it. So irrespective of what your backend systems are, whether they are connected or not, out systems helps us uh, give you that single pane of glass so that as a patient, I am just looking at one single screen to look at either order my medication, look at my prescriptions, schedule appointments, and then UiPath becomes my automation at the back end, where it's taking all this data from the back end systems and giving me all those pretty dashboards or appointments or reminders and things like that. So it's about looking at that and giving the patients the experience of doing it all together, and that's actually happening right now. Yeah. 
And I, and I think part of the pain that a lot of the companies have been feeling is they have these legacy systems at times that are archaic and they're essentially, hey, most of my people that know this have retired <laughs> and so we just don't touch it. Because they're really good at billing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so as we start to see that, they're like, how can I move into this new era? How can I have a common system, but at the same time, leverage what I already have there as my core systems? And that's where we're going with Persistent. It's one to go through and figure out what are those core systems. Out Systems becomes kind of that layer across to be able to access the data and everything you have for legacy systems, but then to be able to abstract that and serve it up. And then they can leverage UiPath to say, hey, now let's go ahead and accelerate and optimize. Um, and it becomes comes that core system. Well, this is something we talk a lot about on theCUBE in that the technology in a lot of ways is the easy part. Yeah. And what you were just describing, Derek, with having to try to get the workers themselves on board, adopting, believing, and understanding in the mission, and then also seeing the benefit to continue working in the system. So yeah. how do you, how does Persistent and OutSystems work together to ensure that the process is, is smooth, or smoother, I should yeah. say? I think. Uh, change management is a huge uh, aspect in terms of any project that we undertake and it's out systems, persistent, UiPath all put together. I think when when the employees or the resources start seeing the change, how easy it is and how seamless it is for them making their day-to-day -day jobs much more easier, it, it's all a blend of that, that brings in the confidence for them to adopt the change. It's, it doesn't happen overnight, it takes time, but I think the proof is right in front of them to see it and start adopting it. You guys, go oh, ahead, please. I was just going to say, I think a lot of times, we make the mistake of just putting together the business case based on the technology. And what we found is in most cases, it's about people. It's about people having to make this transition and make this change. And it's also generational, because there's some older people with you know gray hair or loss of hair like me that, that are in a spot where they're like, do I really want to take on building this new system? And we're starting to see this generational change that's kind of uh, starting to drive that. Uh, OutSystems One was a conference in Amsterdam. Yes. By the way, the Cube loves Amsterdam. Just I <laughs> <laughs> there. Last uh, thank you for being on. Uh, so, so that you guys won the, the OutSystems Innovation Award. Yep. Right. Uh, presumably because you were focused on on business outcomes. Uh, but but what was that award all about? What does that mean to you guys? It's 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 been phenomenal. The partnership has been great, and uh, we are very. Out Systems has been very generous in terms of giving us the award. But specifically talking about it, we developed a solution called Assistex that is primarily using Out Systems UI path, bringing the whole Gen AI aspect to more modernized call center solution. So how you're able to modernize a call, after call center analysis, so taking a call, doing analysis on top of that, automating the backend systems, making the whole process of either ordering or complaints or reordering cancellations much more seamless, helping with the bot. So bringing that whole solution together, that was the whole idea and that was the award. Uh, Congratulations. That, thanks so much. So things are changing so fast, but I do want to have you both look into your crystal balls and, and try to predict a little bit about what we're going to be seeing in, in this low code revolution in the year and years to come really, and what we'll be talking about next year at, at Forward. Yeah, I think uh, we already saw something in Amsterdam last week where OutSystems announced a new product in terms of on their platform where we're talking about how you can use natural language processing to develop applications. So you key in, the business is able to develop a framework of an application, and then somebody like Persistent is helping them enhance that application, either using UiPath or other technologies. So we are already seeing that revolution happen, but I'll let Derek talk about more of that. Well, I think that's a big part of it, is we're starting to see, we're right on the cusp. So we're, we're seeing more power, more capability. You just had it in some of your discussions right before us. I think the power is there, the technology is there. And now we're starting to see companies say, you know what, I can lean in and I can figure this out. And it's definitely moving towards a point, how do we completely abstract away the difficulties in the software development life cycle? How do we make all that go away and let people just create and let them innovate based upon what they're really trying to do. And that, that's the whole effort, I would say, with UiPath and our systems. So that's a vision way beyond generating code, you know, converting <laughs> COBOL to Java. I mean, that's nice. 
But you're talking about uh, outcomes uh, that are really visionary and, and meaningful to organizations and, and individuals, so. And I, and I just, I can't emphasize enough the need for the governance and the structure because we've seen a lot of companies that just really in a spot where they can't make a decision to move forward because of some of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And that's where right now we're seeing the customers that say, wait a minute, I can have best of both worlds. I can innovate and I can take those bold you know, leaps forward and I can leverage platforms that give me the governance structure capability and then the guidance for both the change management yeah. as well as, hey, how do you go about adopting the technology? That fear is the number one blocker, right? The concerns over legal and privacy and regulatory, exactly. like just yep. holding people back. And like you said, there's a lot of navel gazing going on as a result. Yeah. So last question, what is your best advice for companies that are, that are watching this segment and thinking, you know, I, I want to implement a low code platform beyond call me, uh, <laughs> what's, your, what's your advice? I think from me, uh, from my perspective, it would be do not look at projects in isolation, look at an end-to-end -end solution where you're able to bring different problem statements or different uh, solutions and uh, architectures together, look at a wholesome solution and solve for that, solve for the future and not your today's problem. Yeah, so, and I know I'm a technology company, I should say talk to technology, but I would say most importantly, start with what are the outcomes? What are, what are you really trying to accomplish? Yeah. And as you start to do that, then talk to some of those that are a little further ahead of you in that process. We've got a lot of customers that have been innovators and they're out ahead, and they are very, very glad to have conversations with those coming along, just to kind of put some of that fear, uncertainty, and doubt to the side, and let them really be bold and move forward. Derek, Vivek, thank you both so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank nice you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of UiPath Forward 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.